Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again, folks, to this, this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. Folks, as you know, we're right into elections, and what we're focusing on today will be that of Multnomah County. We've got uh, we've got a couple of positions uh, as far as commissions. I think it was district number two. Yes, sir. And um, Teresa. And Teresa and, and several others, including myself and whatever. Mm -hmm. And whatever, Bruce. And Bruce, yes, and whatever. <laughs> and, uh, but the bottom line is that uh, we're going to be focusing on Multnomah County. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we just happen to have uh, our, the, the person running for chair. The chair position is also open. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're going to be doing that also, too. We just happen to have a person who is running. Uh, for the chair of Multnomah County, and I'm talking about uh, uh, Patty Burkett. Yes, sir. Am I right? Yes, sir. Patty Burkett, am I right? And she's running again, like I said, for, for the chair of Multnomah County. And we're going to spend some time with her. We're going to give her 30 minutes. We've also notified the other candidates if they're interested. We're, in fact, uh, we're in the process of getting them together. Uh, we're going to put them on the show also, too. And also, uh, we've also extended an invite to all of the candidates running in district number two, okay? Uh, again, that date, we've got two other candidates that, are, that have yet to um, give us the okay on that piece, but bottom line is that they're still invited if they would like to come, fine, okay? But like I said, we're going to spend the first 30 minutes with Patty, and then we're going to take a break, and then Donnie Adair, one of the one of my co-hosts uh, here at the World Voters Digest, would interview her, and uh, and hopefully you will enjoy that. And like I said, the whole idea is to find out what are the qualifications of these individuals uh, who are wanting to assume those respective positions. And that's what we're going to be doing, and I think it's very important. And by the way, make sure you vote. Make sure you're registered to vote. Very, very important that you be involved in this. This is the largest populated area here within the state of Oregon. Yes, sir. When you think about Multnomah County, in fact, it's larger than the city of Portland. Yes, sir. And it just so happened that the city of Portland is included in, in that in that whole arena. Indeed, you know? yeah. And they've got many, many aspects of whatever that uh, in, in terms of assignments and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to learn more about this. And, and we just happen to have a candidate that, uh, that I, it's my understanding, she's run before. Yes, sir. You know, for the same thing this last time around. I ran in 2012. In 2012, uh, right? Yes, sir. 2012. Commissioner yes. District 3, Judy Shiprack is the incumbent. Right. Okay. So she And I did get 23.81% of the vote as a citizen Good. candidate. Good. Okay. All right, Patty. Well, look, why don't we just go on and start out, Patty? And, okay. And why don't you introduce, the, introduce, introduce yourself to the viewing audience. And okay. Who's Patty? My name, do I look this way or? No, just look at me, just look <laughs> okay. at me. Patty, just, no problem, just, okay, just be Bruce. Patty. I'll I'm sorry. Uh, first of all, this is my first foray into this sort of thing, so I'm really excited and I'm very honored that you've invited me, Bruce. Sure. I really am. Mm -hmm. Bruce is a wonderful gentleman and I really hope that Bruce will be on my team when we win. Well, hey, <laughs> you, when you win, I will be on the team Good. because you'll be, be responding to my issues and yes, concerns, sir. right? Yes, absolutely, Sounds absolutely. Sounds great. So um, I happen to be a Portland da native. Okay. I was born and raised in Portland. I went to Mount Tabor grade school and I went to Washington High School. And I was very involved in activities. My younger sister and I were very much involved in everything from music to choir to thespians to mm -hmm. uh, I was a cheerleader, uh, fall ra varsity rally squad. Uh, in fact, a little kind of aside, when the girls and I were cheering one time at a football game, mm -hmm. the boys were yelling at us because they said we were cheering for the other team. Hmm, really? And we were going, oh! <laughs> <laughs> Not a fun day, not a fun We're having fun, we're kids. Fun day. So what were you doing during that particular time? You know, you, family, you got another, Oh yes. You got a uh, daughter and you got a nice little I grand, do, granddaughter. I do, I do. I have a very uh, attractive family, I'd like to say. Um, my son lives in Los Angeles. He yeah. works for Rudy's, which is a hair salon a business, which okay. is quite famous. Okay. And they have a beautiful store there, and he's their manager there. And that's in Santa Monica. And my daughter, Nicole, is uh, quite the fundraiser. Okay. And she's helping out uh, students at Madison High School mm -hmm. that are um, sports students. And it's required by the district that the uh, teachers that perform these coaching jobs must fundraise. But regrettably, there isn't much of a way for them to fundraise. Mm -hmm. 
So my daughter's taken upon herself to help them off campus, of course, and she has some great prizes. So what are you doing now? I mean, I am in the process of interviewing and speaking with people. I've okay. had several interviews lately. Yeah. I had the great pleasure of speaking at the Rose City Neighborhood Association. Right. That was my first foray, and I, I gave my speech. Good, good. <laughs> well, tell me this. Why, why did you select uh, Multnomah County? And run, I, running for, you, first, you selected running for a commission seat, right? Yes. Against Shipwright. But now you're, you're looking at the chair. Mm -hmm. Why did you select Multnomah County in, as, as, as far as wanting to serve? the people there as uh, as one of the, the well the chair yes uh, well second. first of all the chair is clearly a very important position okay and it's also uh you know it's incumbent upon the chair to be essentially the chief executive of the county mm -hmm. and in keeping with that theme even though i don't have experience as a chief mm -hmm. executive as far as a county would go i certainly have worked all my life and worked with many many people and i'm a very detail oriented person and i've worked very hard with all my, these are some of my papers, to uh, research all the issues. Mm -hmm. And I feel that I have a valid uh, uh, set of ideas for the to impart upon the uh, community about uh, what we can do to help the county. Primarily, my platform is primarily uh, the housing issues for public housing for the poor mm -hmm. and the homeless, which is extremely serious. Mm -hmm. And also another extremely serious issue is our mental health. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, you know, as, as you know, we, you and I chatted before this for mm -hmm. a minute, and you basically cited <coughs> some of the issues that you would like to focus mm -hmm. in. And why don't we start off with mental health yes. aspect of it. What, what, what's your, what's your, first off, what is the definition of mental health as, as relates to Multnomah County? Okay, and then mm -hmm. what do you feel are the issues in mental health at Multnomah County, and how do you feel you can fix them? Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I must confess that I had no idea as to the magnitude of the number of people that were, that literally live with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. It's in the tens of thousands, wow. just in here the within county. this area, yes, in this county. Wow. Yes, in our county, mm -hmm. and that's very tragic. I had no idea it was that difficult. That being said, I feel that the county. Uh, is apparently not respecting or answering to the pleas of the mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. So legislation is not commensurate with the kind of money they need to help the people. Mm -hmm. Could you share well, again with the uh, our viewing audience mm -hmm. as to how do you define mental health? What does that What does that mean? I mean, how well, would you How would you define it? I would define mental health as a sense of feeling comfort within oneself, okay. well, well-being. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, I think there, there obviously it's like the three-legged stool idea. You have to have a decent place to live. Quite frankly, mm -hmm. you have to have good health care, and you have to be able to protect yourself and be able to eat. Mm -hmm. Those are very essential to one's mental health. Clearly, and mental health means, quite frankly, that you're in a good state. I'm and right. I feel that, yes, absolutely, and I feel that many of our constituents, whether they be uh, public, uh, recipients of public uh, assistance or mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. uh, many people are suffering, mm -hmm. many, many people. I take it also veterans are also part oh of, of that, right? Oh my gosh, yes, and I'm and a veteran, PTSD. by the way. Oh, you are a veteran. Yes, sir, I am. Okay. Um, I'm a veteran post-Vietnam, yes. um, but quite frankly, some of the best people I ever met in the whole military were people who were post-Vietnam vets mm -hmm. who had been in Vietnam, right, right, very right, kind right, people. Good. But thank I had a great job. And thanks and I, for serving. Thank you. I yeah, had a great yeah. time, and I met some great people, and yeah. I worked as a courts clerk oh, for really? special courts marshals. And my um, a sergeant major, who was an incredibly talented yes. gentleman, very, very nice, he used to laugh and say, Patty, I appreciate your um, your narratives in your descriptives of what mm -hmm. the uh, – person got, that got into trouble, whatever they ha had right. had happened to them. He said, but you don't really have to tell us that he wore a really cute outfit with a really nice yellow Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, and I said, that's okay, a good point. okay, sir. He goes, I point. like it, but you, don't, you can leave uh, it out. I got you. <laughs> well, Stick thanks, to facts. Again, thanks for serving, Patty. Thank you, okay, sir. Yeah. I, I enjoyed myself yeah, very much. That, I learned a lot. That's really an asset. Because Thank in, you. in all due respect, a lot of times it takes a veteran to understand that PTSD. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I'm yeah. also a Second Amendment uh, act, uh, advocate. Are you? Yes, sir. Okay, good. And what yes, does that mean? To me, that means that you should be able to take and, ha and be able to have arms in your home and be able to protect yourself. And quite frankly, I appreciate there are a lot of people that are against this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I have asked people, just theoretically, if you were, if I were to ask you if you were uh, for or against guns, mm -hmm. what would you say? And they will say, most, a lot of people in Multnomah County will say, I'm against guns and I'm mm -hmm. against violence. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that 
position. However, when I do ask them if they'd be willing to allow me to put a sign on their lawn mm -hmm. that says no guns, mm -hmm. nobody wants to do that. Mm -hmm. Because well, they, don't, they don't want to target their house. They don't want to target their house. Yeah, they don't mm -hmm. want them to have the one saying, mm -hmm. well, I don't want guns. So the whole neighborhood and all the characters out there mm -hmm. will say, oh, well, mm -hmm. they don't like guns, so they probably don't have any. What, so what we'll do you think house. may be the, the, the resolution of this issue of the pro and con same situation with reference to firearms? First, why do you think it exists? And secondly, what do you think we can do as, as citizens? Because, you know, we're all well, living together, yes, right? Yes, sir. And the idea is that we'd like to live in harmony, right? Right. And it is a divide, so to speak. What, 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 what would Patty do to try to solve that problem? A bit? Well, first of all, I feel very strongly that the attitude towards guns is based upon the violence itself, clearly. Okay, okay. That being said, um, we all have a responsibility to do the right thing, and that's the part that's rather difficult to do because mm -hmm. a lot of people have all kinds of different situations going on, and a lot of that is, is affecting one's mental health as well, come to think of it, mm -hmm. because I, I do feel very strongly, although I'm not quite familiar with all the games that all the young people like to yes. play, they're, the, what little I've seen of them are incredibly violent. Mm -hmm. So I think that we keep to, we keep, so those video Pushing. games, yeah, the video That's games are very issue. violent. The ones I've seen so far. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, they look real. That's mm -hmm. the sad part. Is this something you think you might curtail? Or talk I don't to think. Or I don't think it would be my purview to do that okay. because we do live in a free society, clearly. Okay. But I do want to encourage parents, perhaps, mm -hmm. and or the children themselves, quite frankly, mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, violence is not a good thing, obviously. But we're surrounded by it, sadly. Right, right, right. right. Now, what, what, let's, let's a little bit more about the mental health. I understand yes. it, there's a number of folks that are in that, that arena. Yes. Aspect of it. Can you maybe talk a little bit about solutions in that arena? Is there anything particular that you think you might, <coughs> that just comes out as if from the standpoint of saying, hey, uh, they're, they're, they're approaching this issue mm -hmm. uh, this way, mm -hmm. and I'm, I think we should approach it this way. Yes. So what do you think? Can you cite one of those areas that, that you feel that you, you might be able to Yes. Uh, so. I have uh, worked at medical records at OHSU as well. Mm -hmm. I've also worked in pharmacy billing. Uh, and I also worked for a time uh, as a receptionist in behavioral health. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that concerns me primarily is I don't think the legislation that we have coalesces with the issues or the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. And even though I'm not completely familiar with all the legislation involved, I think that there certainly can be things done to help people more effectively. And the, obviously the first place that we have to start, in my view, is to adequately protect the people financially. Mm -hmm. Now I appreciate that a lot of people are upset with having to protect the poor and the indigent and the ill and the elderly. But clearly, ladies and gentlemen, this is the United States of America. And we are known for being a loving country, mm -hmm. we, in spite of the fact that we are warring all over the world. Yeah, the people yeah. themselves yeah. are not approving of okay. these wars, in my okay. view. All right. So mental health. Let's, let's talk a little bit about homelessness. I mean, yes. we talked a little bit about that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. First, define what you think homeless means as far as the county is concerned. And what are some of the concerns that you may have, and i.e. solutions to that, let's uh, say, once elected? Okay. Well, first of all, I don't think the county really regards the homeless people much, nor does the city. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. I do not believe that the county and or the city, and quite frankly the state, I don't think that they regard the homeless or the indigent, indigent population the way that they should. Mm -hmm. I think that they're an afterthought. That's not my opinion. I feel very strongly, based on the fact that I myself have experienced a lot of difficulties in life, my mother was a working class poor person in today's world. Had my mother still been alive with us, I don't believe she would have even been able to afford to buy a home hmm. because she didn't make much money back then and certainly today most people don't make much money now. And I want to change that as well because I think that we can also provide very good housing for people that is reasonable in price. Mm. How do we do that? Now, as you know, the city of Portland, boy, I tell you, we got folks coming in from all over. <laughs> you know, we have such beautiful weather. We don't have the problem back east and whatever. Mm -hmm. Property values are going up. Aspect mm -hmm. of it, people are coming here with money, and so kind of it's getting it's getting tough. Taxes right. are going up. I mean, how would you That's approach that? How, how how would you approach well, the whole housing issue? That's a that's a big fish to fry. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. But I do have some answers. Talk to me. <laughs> Talk to me. Boy, they're waiting. They're waiting for you. Talk to I her. do. I love real estate, by the way. Okay. I love right. real estate. So how do we handle I think real estate is very exciting and very interesting. Uh, 
And because of my interest in real estate, I've discovered a lot of interesting things about property okay. here in the county, okay. Okay. including people's assets okay. that they apparently are not allowed, or excuse me, I've got to take the back. Uh, there are members, officials in government. Apparently this is a rule or a law, I'm not quite certain, I haven't discovered this yet. There is anyway an, a, an in inculcation or expectation that all officials that have property that they own outside the purview of the actual county they work in do not have to reveal those assets. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder, why would you not want to reveal your assets unless you're trying to hide something? Mm -hmm. So what do we do? I mean, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still trying to get the... Okay, we, we, gotta, we, got, we got some... Well, know, well, what, what I mean to say... Okay, in yeah. reference to yeah, that, yeah, what do we do as far that? as the housing goes, the county has the purview of the re real estate taxes. When you have people that owe money on the real estate taxes, mm -hmm. you, you've got up to a three-year window potentially before the tax goes, in, or before the house can poss possibly go into foreclosure. Mm -hmm. The sad reality is that a lot of builders who are coming into our uh, city, or excuse me, to our county and to our whole state, who are coming here to build these micro-housing units are buying these houses for virtually nothing or these properties for mm -hmm. virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. They're not paying the taxes up front. They're holding that back to basically uh, back tax onto the potential buyer. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you're going to uh, uh, acquire property in the county, it would be, it should be part of the law that you should pay off the taxes first before you start making some big decisions as to what you're going to do with that piece of property, mm -hmm. especially as an investor or a builder, mm -hmm. because they're taking away from us. They're not they're not mm -hmm. helping us. So what about the housing piece? I'm still want to get you. Okay, the housing opinion. part how, how is do you, how do you get these? How do you get from point mm -hmm. A to point B? You got okay. all these folks that are homeless aspect right. of it, and then there's this pitch about pitch about uh, uh, they we need to provide housing. Yes. How, how would you do that in, well, in the county? What would you um, do? One of the things that I would do, and I think that we can already look at these properties. There are there's a huge surplus okay. of properties that are owned by the county. By the county. Okay. By the county. Now, I appreciate I don't know what all these properties are. Some of them may be just bare land, and some of them may have a single house on them, and or it may be an industrial site. However, I'm quite certain that there's more than enough room for everyone to have a place to live. So and you're I think about that maybe that's being held back on purpose. So you're yes. thinking about maybe setting aside some of those foreclosures and, and, mm. uh, and maybe inviting well, uh, builders or developers to... Uh, i.e., well, they make a profit, but at the same time, it would be pro it would be set aside for for the housing if they meet, met certain criteria. Is that what you basically you're saying? Yes, somewhat. Except for the fact that I really want to emphasize public service on the part of everyone, including the private builders. So yeah. I'm not quite certain how to go about that at this okay. point in time, other than perhaps provide them other incentives, whether it be tax incentives mm -hmm. and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. which I think that we can do. That being said. Um, I really feel strongly that the private sector and the, and the businesses that have had the privilege of experiencing great uh, incentives from the city, specifically, mm -hmm. for properties all over the county, is incorrect. I don't mm -hmm. think it's correct. I don't think they should do and that. You want to change that? Well, maybe, I think maybe, we maybe should change a, that. Maybe call a conference of some sort where everybody would sit down <laughs> and try to figure out what do we do about this? Well, call the builders, with the bankers. And oh yeah! In fact, as a matter of fact, I'm going to another event with mm -hmm. the Metropolitan Business Association too. Okay. That's a large audience, so yeah. I definitely will talk to that as well. Okay. All right then. Yeah. Look, why don't we get? That was another area that you were, that was of interest that struck my interest. Oh yeah. With the fact that uh, how uh, uh, gambling promotions, if you will, to seniors. You know yes. what I mean? Whether they be uh, step on the tube. Mm -hmm. and, and uh, mail mail outs and mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. whatever w why would you bring up this issue and and how would you deal with this issue well um first and foremost if it am yeah, I, sure. you just hold this up sure. for me or have you hold that up for me um yeah, I'll do that for you. this particular i'm sure that if anyone that receives um uh, ssd social security disability or mm -hmm. ssi which is social security insurance which is okay. the purview of this of the state by the okay. way that one Okay. All of the folks that get this uh, little uh, 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 flyer, um, it's attached, if you will see right down here, there's the MasterCard symbol. Yeah, and that's right. with the Direct Express card, which is, mm. which is dispensed to all of the people that have uh, 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 public assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that concerns me about this primarily is that this little flyer is sent out to people, I think maybe, maybe once a month or maybe, it always seems to come for people at the time just before they get their money. Mm. Hmm. Now, this little document says that if you scratch the ticket, you can enter a contest to win money. Hmm. 
The part that they don't tell you. Oh, excuse me. They do the tell you. Print. The fine print. They, <laughs> <laughs> they do tell you the fine print. But the difficulty is, as you can see, it's quite fine. And even me with my glasses, I, I can't see it. And I don't have my glasses on I even. I have to take mine and get mine I know. It's very tiny. <laughs> I mean, even an ant can't see yeah. that. But for the same token, excuse me, um, uh, my point to that is that it says right on that little document in the teeny tiny print yeah. that if you win money, mm -hmm. money from your direct express account will be taken from you. Wow. Wow. Now, so, I so think how, that's how do we saw that? But it's, a, it's kind of like another mini casino, so, so to speak. But, it's not just but, a mini but casino, But it, my Bruce. point is that it comes to the house, I'm just saying. Yes, that's but it's saying. more than that, though, Bruce. Talk that's the, the, the thing that strikes me the most about this particular piece yeah. of paper in okay. this company. This company is called Bancart. B-A-N-C-O-R-P. Bancorp, excuse Bancorp, me. Bancorp, okay. Bancorp. Mm. They're based out of the East Coast. I believe it's Connecticut or, or uh, New Hampshire. It may be Connecticut, though. My point is, is that the woman that owns that business, her name is Betsy Cohen. Mm -hmm. Betsy Cohen, I believe, is probably in, I would guess, in her 90s or so. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite certain. Her son... I don't recall his first name. I want to say Stephen Cohen, but he's definitely a Cohen mm -hmm. also. He's a very big lobbyist, a Republican lobbyist for the financial world mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. But not Oregon. Well, he I not, imagine Earl not. knows him quite well, mm -hmm. as does Mr. Wyden and mm -hmm. uh, all the other okay. folks, Suzanne okay. and what okay. have you. So I what about imagine. the Attorney General here, the State Attorney General? A lot of times that's basically what one of the things uh, that they do. They check out these so-called... A shady sort well, of operation. Maybe they don't consider this shady because it's coming mm. from their friends. Because mm. mm. okay. Mrs. Cohen is a friend of Bill and Hillary. Mm. And quite mm. frankly, um, Mrs. Cohen makes a lot of money off of the poor. Mm. She also makes money off of the poor by virtue of the fact of these cards, which are dispensed. I think she's in, I believe she's in about 30 or 32 states right now. She mm -hmm. was in 17 the first wow. time I found out about it. And her Bancor business handles all those accounts, and then they're dispensed out to mm -hmm. all the different states. Mm -hmm. But they get the money on the 21st of the month. Mm -hmm. So from the 21st to the time that people first get their money, which is, I think, in some cases, the 1st, the 3rd, mm -hmm. or the um, 9th or 10th. Um, all of that time goes by, and Mrs. Uh, Cohen's business makes a lot of profit mm -hmm. off so of what, the interest. So what will you do as chair of Multnomah County to, to Mrs. Well, Cohen's business? Would you I would them, rec or? Would I would recommend them? that she stop this, number one, because mm -hmm. it's, and if she wants to help pay for the gambling addiction of Oregon, then I'd be more than happy to invite her to do so. Oh, okay. All right, then. This is <laughs> another piece. Okay. And it's also affecting our student loan kids, too, or okay. young people and adults. Mm, okay. She has the purview of that as well okay. here locally. So this is a major issue with Oh, you. very much okay, so. Good. Because the they're forcing people to gamble. And yeah. In one side of the hand, they're telling people, Go ahead and gamble. Mm -hmm. On the other side of this hand, they're saying to people, "Oh, mm -hmm. you can't gamble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you if gamble, you're going to lose your money. Mm -hmm. and it's not fair." What, what, what do you think about Multnomah County? As far as you know, we are kind of a uh, we, we are the lot one of the we actually we are the largest populated mm -hmm. area uh, within the state. And mm -hmm. actually, there's gambling within that particular in that in this mm -hmm. arena. You know, you've got I've worked uh, for gambling uh, you know, and you've got uh, you got the video poker. You got all these different things. What do you think about that? Do you, you feel good and comfortable with the with the, the direction we're going in that arena? No. If we don't, I, then what would you do about it? What would you do about it? Well, I incidentally have worked for major casinos okay. as a tracking clerk and as a blackjack okay. uh, clerk. Okay. I also worked at Spirit Mountain Casino. So what do we do? You think you think we're going in the right way in Oregon uh, by pushing the, the the whole issue? Of no, gambling? I don't. I I really, honestly, I I'm not a gambler myself. So it's funny that I even go work at these places. But I need to support my children. Um, the bottom line is, I don't think it's good for the people because it just adds to the violence in life. So what would Patty do? Patty would it probably allow the people to, uh, they can continue with their bingo okay, <laughs> and win right. prizes. Okay, bingo, <laughs> only bingo. Okay, all right then. Well, they can now, do, I don't, you know, I'm not against people doing things to have fun, but that's right. the sad reality. Right. I don't consider gambling fun. I think people need to have more fun things to do. And mm -hmm. in my view, one of the keys to our mental health and we all know that is music. Yeah, right. I hear you. Now, that was one other area. We got mm -hmm. only about five minutes now. Oh, big pardon. Yeah, we got five by five minutes. Now, I understand you're going to be attending the Oregon Assembly of Black Affairs, and uh, what's going what, what, yes. what, what's, what's going to be your message to them? What, what are you going to say to them? Well, do I have to tell? Because I've already written a speech. And it's a doozy. <laughs> That's okay. Public might want to know too. I mean, you know, well, how many voters out there might want to know? I, I, re I think, what think basically what I will speak to at their event because I'm I'm incidentally I am very good about reading up on everybody's right. groups. Okay. I think that's important to be aware okay. and to be uh, involved. 
I hope to express to this wide group of uh, uh, constituents and their guests, because right. it's an open forum, right. um, I want to let the people know that I do care about them. I want them to feel a sense of peace and happiness in their lives. Mm -hmm. I think our veterans are deeply in need of help and love and understanding, um, and as are everybody. I mean, our whole community. I, I feel very sad also for the county employees because mm. they are bruised. And I want to work with them, and quite frankly, I want to work right there with them and shadow them and learn how to do their jobs. Mm. And I also know how to drive a commercial truck. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And a bus. Okay. okay. So, so your message to them is just... I want uh, to work with the people and, get, and you need to be... Dis you, the people need to be properly served. Mm -hmm. They're not being properly served. Mm -hmm. The county is in a crisis mode. Mm -hmm. We're in a major crisis mode. I'm not quite certain why the other candidates seem to think that everything's hunky-dunky, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are people suffering terribly. Mm -hmm. And I would challenge any candidate out there Mm -hmm. That if you want to know how it feels to be poor, I encourage you, I can find you a whole bunch of places to hang out and live in for a week or a month, mm -hmm. and you can feel what it feels like, and you can ride the bus to work or walk or wherever you go, mm -hmm. and you can go without food if your food stamps don't last long enough, and you can experience that, and you can feel sick and have to go to a doctor and wait in line to see whether or not a doctor will even be able to see you because you have no insurance. Okay. Tell me something. Yes, sir. If elected, uh, yes. when, you, when you're elected, yes. what would be the first thing on your agenda? As in terms of what would you tell the people you're going to be going to do? What's the first thing you're going to do? You're, going to get, you're on the job now, and you're going to have, you've got your staff in the front of you, and you're <laughs> going to say, here's the assignment, and this is what we're going to do for the next two or three months or whatever. Well, What are you going to do? What are you going to say to them? I'm going to say to them we're going to make a lot of changes to the benefit of all of us, okay. that we're going to work with each other in a positive way, that we're okay. going to cohesively work okay. together with the people, and that I want everybody to be happy in what they do, okay. and I want to work with everyone, and I'm not going to be just sitting in a desk, sitting at a desk person. I'm going to go out into the community and talk to every single mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. and I also want to encourage our young people to be involved in politics and to learn how to train them mm -hmm. to, to be politicians, okay. to learn how this job is done, mm -hmm. because there is no template. You're kind of on your own. You're mm -hmm. on your own little ship. And I, I am on my own little ship. I'm completely separate. I'm accepting absolutely no donations whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I do not want to because I don't think that I don't, that way I can say whatever I want. And people, I don't have to owe anybody anything. And then secondly, if elected, and I tend to be elected, I will donate 25% of the chair's salary to charity for one specific reason, probably more, quite frankly, but at least 25% because there are the poor people. That if your family member protects you and helps you and takes care of you in any way, shape, or form, 25% of your money is taken away from you. Mm, mm. But if a stranger takes care of you, mm. they get up to $2,000. Mm. So how much does that represent? I mean, what, what's the chair's salary? It's my understanding that the chair's salary is about $140,000 a year, which is a significant amount of money, clearly. So 25% of that, right? Yes. Oh, but okay. I would say, oh, yeah. In fact, knowing, knowing you asked my That's daughter 20, and family. 25% of the gross or 25% of the net? What would you oh, say? Oh, no, no. The gross, the, the absolutely. Gross. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, if... Knowing my, as my children know me and various people know me around the community, uh, if I could do the job for free, I would. Really? I have to make, oh, yeah. Really? I'd love to. Well, I think generous. it'd be a great thing to do. I think everybody Sounds should do that, especially the people that have all the money. Sounds great. It's certainly well, not me. Well, Patty, <laughs> Patty this it was good. I, uh, thank you. I wish you luck. I mean, thank you. Know, you. Things like that. You know, uh, I think you've got your heart right. In fact, I take my hat off to anybody that's thank willing you. to sign you too, on the Bruce. dotted line and wanting to run for office. These are thank some you. tough times during these times. And it takes the enthusiasm uh, and that you have. You I'm know, very respect. excited. I'm and, very, very know, pleased. All of them. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and good thank luck you to for you. this venue. And right, so. I want to thank you so much because this is my first official big time moment. And oh, I'm so excited to see you, Bruce. Thank you. And I have a nice gift for you, too, that I'm going to send to you. Oh, sounds great. Sounds it has better. nothing to do with politics. Right. <laughs> it's donate. just a nice photograph, quite sounds frankly. Great. Sounds great. It's a okay. photograph of Robert Kennedy. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to take a short break, and uh, uh, our next, next uh, guest will be Teresa Redford and Donnie Adair. Our uh, co-host will basically do a, an interview with, with Teresa Redford. We'll take a short break. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend.
Hey everybody, welcome back to Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, guest host this afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce and to interview Teresa Rayford. Teresa, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, Donnie. Thank Teresa you. is running for position number two on the Multnomah County Commission. Very important position to us, uh, Teresa. And so we look forward to hearing what you can share with us today about your candidacy and how you would contribute in that particular role. Absolutely. I want to start out by acknowledging that you ran for office not too long ago, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. I ran back in uh, 2012. And, and what, <laughs> what office was it for at that it time? It was for city commissioner. I was running against Amanda Fritz and Mary Nolan at the time. Okay. So. Was that your first experience in running? Yeah, it was. Okay. Um, I had worked with the county mm -hmm. and the community so much. And my, uh, the leadership that advised me to work with in the government system was Mayor Adams. So I figured, okay, well, maybe I need to work with the next mayor, and maybe I need to sit on a seat on the city council so that we can get some things going. Uh, but what I learned in that race and also within the last couple of years is that most of the issues that I was working with hands-on were really issues that were happening right there in the county. And their service-oriented outreach is more of what I need in order to be hands-on with what I do in our community. Well, give our viewers a little bit about your background. Okay, well, um, I'm a native, native Portlander. That's two of us. Uh, <laughs> right on. Uh, my parents were both born here in Portland, Oregon. My grandfather on my mom's side was born here. He grew up in southwest Portland, was, you know, a part of the Navy. His mm -hmm. dad was uh, part of the first police auxiliary force. Uh, on my dad's side, his mom and dad owned businesses here, and a lot of people know about the possum incident. <clears throat> right, which on Martin was just Luther blocks King. from here. Yeah, in <laughs> March 1981 here in our city, um, which kind of, you know, pushed a movement that got us, you know, basically starting to stand up for our rights. Not to say that uh, the communities of color or those that were, you know, in the high poverty areas weren't already standing for themselves, but that's kind of a spark that was a lightning pushed rod. the movement mm -hmm. for my generation. Absolutely. Something I really remember and I respect and, um, you know, just the history of it. And, and I use it to help stay motivated. Okay. And in, in terms of your career path, you've oh. been pretty much uh, self-employed? Absolutely. Well, I, I worked for Bank of America. I worked for TXU Energy, which was a, a deregulated energy <laughs> market out there in Dallas, Texas, doing mergers and acquisitions. I also worked with Conway Logistics. And, you know, what I learned in all those companies as far as dealing with finance and customers and regulations was that there's a blueprint for every business, every corporate entity that people go by in order to create efficiencies for mm -hmm. their business. Those are multi-million dollar companies and they mm -hmm. ran efficiently. And so uh, being involved with those type of companies and then starting my own business, doing business development with my business partner who's a CPA, uh, I realized that I, ran, I, I was given skills that would take me anywhere. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, you know, across the line of all the different industries we worked with, coming home, and having background in nonprofits and background in for profits and even grassroots organizations, I knew how to develop better, more efficient relationships for okay. them. And so that's kind of what I've been bringing back to the community. In the well, let me ask you why are you running for Multnomah County Commission position number two at this time? Well, uh, District 2 is in my neighborhood. Uh, the positions aren't set up the same way they are in city council. And that's north and north, northeast? Northeast, yeah. Uh, St. John's all the way far out to northeast 181st in that area. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that's a big section of our community. It's a uh, community where most of my family lives, where a lot of the people that I grew up with uh, live, and where there's a lot of poverty and a lot of disproportionality and a lot of... Uh, it's, it's a lack of communication and mm -hmm. engagement, and I think that those things uh, coming from somebody that lives in those communities could help level the playing field in mm -hmm. Multnomah County. The numbers don't lie. We have a lot of uh, ineffective leadership mm -hmm. within that district. So, okay. um, well, I, You talk about that. Uh, one of the questions I'll move up that I, I had uh, formulated for you was, uh, what is your assessment of how the Multnomah County Commission has performed over the last few years? Well, I would I would say that numbers don't lie. You know, in the last 10 to 15 years, our education system, the numbers are dropping. We have the hungriest children. Uh, like I said, our rates of poverty are, you know, almost to the national levels so when we talk about a county as big or as small as Multnomah mm -hmm. in the state of Oregon. Um, 
And so I don't think that we're where we need to be, and I don't even think that we're on the way there unless we start engaging with our community. Uh, right now, what I've learned over the last four years from a, you know, a business or in a, an analytical standpoint is that we do have a lot of funding coming in. We have a, great, a lot of great intentions, but we're not focusing on resolution building. Mm -hmm. And so without implementing strategies that will change the numbers and make them more positive in, you know, in regards to our education system and our poverty and our health system and mm -hmm. even our safety for our seniors, uh, I don't see us getting any better, mm -hmm. so it's time for new leadership. But what does what does Multnomah County do to influence education issues like educational achievement? Well, I think that uh, because we have so many teachers that live in our district, and we have so many children with health issues, we have a lot of families that have poverty, and mm -hmm. let's say community health issues within okay. the family structures that that's where we need to lean our service okay. and our support. And we need to be a little bit more tighter and aware of where we can help uh, get the families where they need to be. Everybody knows a, hun a hungry child is not going to do good in school. Okay, okay. So. great. Um, let's discuss what you believe are the most important issues facing the county now and in the future. And I kind of want to look at it uh, in three segments. First okay. of all, what are the most important current issues? And then I'll ask you to talk about issues facing the county over the next two to four years. And then long term, say five to 25 years, because uh, government has to look way out in the, to oh. the future and try to prepare for changes that are projected uh, uh, in, in the area of service. So start with uh, current issues. What are the most important current issues facing well, the county right now? Well, currently, and, I, and I'll and i say it because of my background and what got me interested in politics in the first place, uh, I, I became familiar with Multnomah County's uh, relationship to District 2 as far as leadership when Barbara Wheeler was the District 2 Commissioner. And what she was doing was uh, she was organizing community members to offset the youth violence that was happening in our community. And right now there's a Rob Ingram summit that's coming up and they're dealing with youth and the crime and the poverty that we call community health issue. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my mind, mm -hmm. that is one of our biggest issues, even with our public safety, the mental health people are the ones that are most affected uh, by it. We have a lot of people that are living mm -hmm. on the streets and you know of course there's a lot of homeless people that are dying that we don't report on all the time but that's a big issue here and, and including suicide. I mean I'm a gun rights um, you know I, I, I believe in gun rights but right now we have a lot of issues and me and you've touched mm -hmm. it a little yes. bit uh, with children committing suicide. I think that we have more uh, youth that are committing suicide by gun mm -hmm. than there are youth that are actually out here committing crimes against each other with them mm -hmm. and so we have to start looking at those things. They might not be that it's sensational but it's actually happening in our county mm -hmm. and I think that there's things that we need to focus on to prevent that so okay. I think the public health is one of the biggest issues okay other current issues uh, well the public health no, of well, course mm -hmm. jobs jobs yes <laughs> which I mean uh, I was at a forum the other night and people were asking about uh, you know what's going to happen when our children come out of jail or when the adults that were children come out of jail and they're trying to compete in the workforce here mm -hmm. and there is no competition even for the ones mm -hmm. that aren't going to jail mm -hmm. because uh, we have an influx of people that right. are moving here to our city and within this county and they're competitive on a mm -hmm. global market right. for work and for the jobs that we have to offer. The children that are graduating through our public school system aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones that are coming out of jail, a lot of times they have that criminal history that's keeping them out of the workforce. Well, and statistics are deceiving. I know in just looking at the uh, county website, even this morning, mm -hmm. uh, it listed unemployment at 7.1%, but you're talking about populations where unemployment is, <laughs> numbers are very disparate. Absolutely. It may be 20% among it may be people of color, uh, immigrants, or and also terribly high with people who may have uh, been involved with the criminal justice system. Absolutely, there's a, a serious disproportionate number there. And you know, being in business development, working with CPAs, uh, admiring the work that is done on a grassroots level, I think that the only solution for a lot of those people uh, will come through STEM technology and some of the things that I fight for, mm -hmm. science, technology, STEM is. Okay. engineering, and math, um, mm -hmm. because that's the basis of opportunity. My great-grandfather used to tell people, you better learn a trade, you need to learn how 
a plumber or you need to do carpentry or something like that so that you could be your own boss. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I see that as something that would probably help not only our youth, but some of the people that are out here dealing with poverty on a level where education isn't an option. Yeah, and you testified about oh. the Benson High School, did you? Oh, not absolutely, recently? absolutely. I went on a tour uh, with Rob Johns over there, who's the Benson High School alumni. And I mean, the classrooms there, they're doing wonderful work. Mm -hmm. The children are excited. They're the managers of those classrooms. They're winning, you know, mm -hmm. national awards. And that, that program is right here in our city, but mm -hmm. that program is also capped because we have programs that we're saying are necessary for our children that are in poverty, mm -hmm. but they're not helping them graduate. Okay. And I see that type of system as something that would be more functional for us. But again, we need courageous leadership to stand up and say that that's what it is, okay. you know? Before I ask you to, to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, uh, issues facing community uh, two to four years and five to 25 years, I wanna remind our viewers that you're watching Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, guest host for Bruce Broussard, and I'm talking with Teresa Rayford, who is running for position number two on the Multnomah County Commission. Yes. So, Teresa, tell us uh, about the issues facing the community over just the next few years, say two to four years. Well, uh, recently we've heard a lot about development, and uh, one of the things that I realized is that there's really no uh, local outreach to our seniors and some of the people that own homes in our community that will probably become locations for future development. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of millennials that are coming out of our foster care system that are graduating out of our high school system that will probably need to find homes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm thinking that uh, along those lines, we need to converge on some uh, some planning. Mm -hmm. We need to start planning for uh, for communities that aren't going to be living within their homes. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be able to find it easy to get jobs. And so we need to start uh, working on affordable housing. We need to start making sure that the development that we bring into our city is bringing in jobs right. um, in forms of uh, public safety. Some of the seniors, we have a lot of baby boomers that mm -hmm. are retiring. And, you know, I'm one. See, and I'm not going to call you an old man or anything like that, but um, I catch the bus, I mm -hmm. catch TriMet, and I'm walking down streets that don't even have sidewalks, mm -hmm. you know, and you're right. walking through ditches and things of yeah. that sort. So with family but dynamics Economic changing, development definitely has a, oh. a relationship to gentrification, for example, oh. does it not? Absolutely, but you're if, you're, if you're on the inside of that and you're a leader and you're wanting to bring that opportunity out to the people that live in the community outside of just the interests of the businesses, then they can become a part of that solution as well. If you're developing, why aren't those development jobs going into these uh, communities? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we going into those communities to make sure that the schools are bringing out those type of workforce millennials? Um, and so that's, you know, that, that type of hands-on relationship with our community is what I want to bring into our Multnomah County Commission because it's needed. Look out long term. Get your crystal ball out <laughs> and, and look out 25 years and what is the information that you read and and know about telling you the county needs to be doing to prepare for long-term issues well i know that right now we're working on our portland plan we're looking at our bridges being reinforced and some of them okay. reconstructed counties play uh, a major part in the bridges oh, across the willamette river absolutely and we also play a major part in uh, part in making sure that all contractors have access to associating their businesses with that type of development okay. uh, but i've been talking to a lot of contractors and people that do that type of work and they're finding it hard to get bonded mm -hmm. Uh, they'll start projects or they might not even go to, to receive the opportunity to start the projects because of these type of issues mm -hmm. with not knowing the rules of engagement mm -hmm. or they don't have a, a infrastructure that's sustainable mm -hmm. to receive these type of opportunities. So again, I think that's where the county can come in and be that service provider or at least be that, uh, that partner and leverage and talk to some of these banks or these different organizations and make sure that they have the information they need mm -hmm. to be able to be competitive in that market because we're gonna be growing. Portland's right. growing, right. We, we want more sidewalks, we want more bike lanes, we want you know infrastructure as far as, you know there's a lot of earthquakes that have been happening in California. Right. And so we need to be ready for emergency preparedness but we also have a lot of buildings that we wanna keep. Uh, they just passed some new type of legislation, I don't know if that's what I want to call it, 
but uh, local people can now invest in keeping our historical buildings. Mm -hmm. Well, they're still going to have to be retrofit for earthquakes, earthquakes. and for okay. different types of uh, issues we're having with our weather. We just had a mudslide right up the street mm -hmm. in Washington State yes. that, you know, has taken lives, and we're still on a death count with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to start making sure County we have a great foundation. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure people are ready that, you know, they're prepared for these changes but we also want everybody to take uh, ownership yeah. in building that structure. What, what about the demographic changes that have been projected and of course I guess this week there were articles in local periodicals uh, looking at last year's data of the influx of uh, residents to uh, Portland Multnomah County area and how many immigrants yes, were a part that. of that. Yeah so looking out you know long term what do you think the county might have to do to prepare and deal with that change in demographics? Well, I think what we have to start with again is our health because if that many people are coming here and we're already fighting for the jobs that are here, we're going to have to make sure that we don't create another homeless issue mm -hmm. because everybody's not going to get the jobs that we have available now. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to start, you know, allowing development to happen. We have to start making sure that everybody is qualified to take part in that because what we're doing is we have two cities in one district. Mm -hmm. We have people that are doing very well to do, and then we have people that are going down as far as their uh, level of poverty and opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, we have to start thinking about maintenance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. You know, how do we maintain what we have so that we can adequately accept what we are going to receive? And I think I read that same article. It said about mm -hmm. 2,300 people yes. out of the 3,200 or something like that that we're moved immigrants. in were immigrants. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they move here and they're already having issues with language mm -hmm. and cultural relationships, we don't want them to have to be homeless alongside the homeless people that we here, have here already. So, okay. Let me ask you to just uh, think about this from a, a, a personal slash professional point of view. And I want to ask you, what's the first thing you would do if you're elected to the Multnomah County Commission position number two? <laughs> Uh, establish town halls. Uh, we need engagement from the community. We okay. need those voices to back us up as leaders. Um, a lot of what I saw when I first got involved in politics and just from the standpoint of being civically engaged was that a leader can tell me at any point, even after elected, well, there's nothing I can do about that or mm -hmm. I can't get all that done. But mm -hmm. what I learned is that once the people have their voice on the record, once we're there standing side by side with the people we elect, to get things done, our voices being on the record, us being engaged, um, it makes a difference. So I would like to immediately establish town halls. I, you know, I wrote down a little proposal where I want to do them once a month, mm -hmm. you know, and just get our community members and call them stakeholders okay. instead of the, the ones we select and, and let them get their voices on the record based on an agenda that has to do with policy and infrastructure. So, okay. You've talked about education. You've talked about economic development. Uh, we haven't talked much about justice slash police community relations type issues. And I know you've been involved in that. And I was interested in what can you do with those issues or to contribute to solutions in those areas from a, a county commission position? Well, you, you work very closely to the police, you know, mm -hmm. the police department, uh, Multnomah County Health Department. All those people are sitting at the table when we talk about gangs. Okay. You go to the gang task force meetings, you have so many different heads of agencies, so many different managers, and the majority of them have on Multnomah County badges. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I think that we you need to do... You got probation and parole. You got pro and everybody. Up, everybody has everybody the mountain on their the jacket. System, right. And you see why I'm running for that seat. Mm -hmm. But um, everybody has that interest vested into their job description, but I don't know if we're doing enough outreach. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of homeless people that the first people or the first responders to what they need is the police. Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be our community health outreach workers. I think instead of being in the malls and, you know, basically 
what we call profiling because we know there's a lot of that happening but without being so aggressive to the people that are living in society um, you know basically shopping going to school and all those things we need to find out what's happening with the brother that's out there on the street mm -hmm. is he a veteran is there a service provider that I can find for him that'll take care of his health needs mm -hmm. uh, what's happening with this family that's out here on the street what kind of services do we have in the county that can help them get out of poverty I think we need to readjust some of our outreach mm -hmm. so that it's more personable and more supportive to the people that are out there that are our most vulnerable. Okay. Talk a little bit about health services uh, and health care reform. Uh, there's a connection there well, and there a role for the county. Am I Absolutely, right? Absolutely, because right now we're doing a lot of our health reform through our policing. If you look at the numbers, I, I read an article the other day that said, oh, now we have the Affordable Health Care Act so we can help provide services to inmates. Mm -hmm. Why not start getting those services to them before we have to call them inmates? You right, know? Right. And so th that's why I think those things have a lot to do with one another. But um, I've worked you know, with community members directly that are dealing with the methadone clinics. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with that for pain management. Okay. It's outside of the hospital. How do you never use heroin in your life, mm -hmm. have a child, get a back, you know, back injury, and then go to methadone and become mm -hmm. an, an addict downtown, mm -hmm. which in turn, you know, a lot of these people are losing their children. They're going right into the system because of our management system and how we do our referrals. So I think a lot of that needs to be looked at. We need to identify what relationships are a risk to our public health um, and then in regards to our public safety because, you know, if you're turning, you know, into an addict because you're using methadone for pain management, mm -hmm. you're more likely going to start committing crimes. Okay. And that's what I've seen myself personally out there. So, What about uh, one uh, service that's really important to us through the county, and that's library services. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm going to be at the library in St. John's tomorrow okay. uh, actually reading a book that I co-authored along with a lot of other fabulous people called uh, Where the Roses Smell the Best. Okay. And one of my first jobs was at Multnomah County Library over there on Killingsworth. Right. So you're definitely a <laughs> library services oh, supporter. absolutely. Everybody in my family is a bookworm, and um, I think that that's something that is underutilized. I think that our libraries are going to become public forums for community action. Uh -huh. uh, we might need to use the libraries as our locations for our town halls. Okay. But I think that that's a fun, uh, informative place to start finding resolutions. So you want to continue strong oh, absolutely. fiscal support for the oh, libraries absolutely. and so forth. Uh, what about talk really in our closing moments here, and I want to remind our viewers that we're, this is Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Donnie Adair, guest host for Bruce Broussard, and we're talking with candidate Teresa Ref Rayford for Multnomah County Commission position number two. And in the few minutes that we have left, talk a little bit about small business and what the county could and should be doing to promote small business. Oh, absolutely. Well, um, quite recently I was invited to a, a Pano event by Ping Sutherland, mm -hmm. and she is the, I think she's the president of the a Asian Commerce. And uh, what, I, what I see with our small businesses is they do need a lot more exposure, but a lot of them do need education. Uh, there's a lack of accounting uh, mm -hmm. support. Uh, a lot of people are looking for funding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that what we might need to do is uh, provide resources in that field of, uh, as far as providing education mm -hmm. and certain types of credits and mm -hmm. opportunities to small businesses that are going to be able to do well. Uh, as partners with the county, you know, and providing jobs or resources like internships or just, you know, just basically bo being more um, affectionate with us okay. as far as what we want to do with, with the community needs. Uh, the city is looking at those big, large, global corporate relationships coming in. I think the county needs to look at what are our assets that we have here. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we have an arts tax that everybody has to pay into. Right. And I, you know, I agree with how it's being worked out. I looked at some of the things the other day, and I was, I was happy to see it. Mm -hmm. I didn't see uh, the numbers the way that I thought that they were until I read this article. Uh, but what I've learned is that a lot of our art community will benefit from that. Recently, we've had shows that have been shut down on hip-hop artists and things of that sort. And I'm letting them know that if they set up their companies, you know, you might be a rapper or you might be a comedian like your son is. But if you set yourself up as a company and mm -hmm. you get an accountant and you're going out there and you're working with these arts organizations, receiving the type of funding that they have, that becomes a stability. Uh, it becomes an income 
that is actually your business. It's no longer okay. a hobby. That we've uh, got about a minute left, and I want to give you an opportunity okay. to just uh, tell us any bits of information <laughs> that we may have missed out uh, from our questions that you think is important for the viewers for for uh, Oregon Voters Digest to uh, here. Okay, well, um, I was going to say that we have a, a campaign headquarters at 5257 Northeast Martin Luther King, Suite 202E. Um, I'm always there, so I'm open for people to come and ask questions. We have a website, www.teresaformultnoma, that's T-E-R-E-S-S-A-F-O-R-M-U-L-T-N-O-M-A-H.com. <laughs> And just, you know, contact us, have questions, you know, ask us the questions, uh, come to some of the forums, become civic minded, mm -hmm. register to vote so that you can vote in this Definitely campaign. Definitely register to vote. Absolutely. You have to be registered in order to Especially cast your you ballot. Especially you kids. Oh, absolutely. The youngsters. Your voices do you know? matter. I know that because I put mine on the record and I see yeah. the change and I know we can do more. Right. Well, thank you very much for coming on and talking with us on Voters Digest today. Uh, appreciate Bruce Broussard providing this opportunity oh, for me absolutely. to interview you and, and get your message out. I'm Donnie Adair. This has been a wonderful opportunity to share and come back and host Oregon Voters Digest. And yes. we'll see you next week. Thank you, Donnie.